It's an honor to be here and educate a little bit about HIV and transactional work. Um, like uh, Aralda said, I do work for uh, Dismas Charities Recovery Resource Center. Uh, Dismas Charity uh, uh, is an organization that has halfway houses throughout the nation, helping those individuals that are, uh, or people who are recently re released from federal prisons and giving them a safe space so they can transition back into community. Next. So um, about the, the conflict of interest disclose statement, I have nothing to disclose. I am gonna disclose in throughout the PowerPoint that I also have living experience and topic. So I am gonna talk a little bit about my experience, but also what I've seen in the front lines and working with this population. Next. So I really love this, uh, this uh, slide, you know, and I presented for AACT before, and I think that the bias disclosure is so important because things change. When I first started in the, in the field 14, uh, 15 years ago, language was way different than to is now, images, uh, stigma, stigma was seen differently. So it's very important. And I think that I am a person who's perfectly imperfect so basically, if you feel that there's some bias or some, that you feel that you can educate me or everybody here in this platform, feel free to do it on the chat. Next. So these are my learning objectives. My first learning objective is defining transactional work and sex work. Okay. The next one is to differentiate human trafficking and sex work. The next one is discuss the drivers of sex work, engagement, and the spectrum of sex work. The next one is discuss sex workers' rights as human rights. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to be a little, you know, when I present, I'm very forward and I, I, I really, you know, and I, I really say how I really feel. It's not for me. Remember, it's for the community that we're working and the person that we're trying to encourage to change and also to get help, right? Um, the next one is to discuss strategies to engage sex workers with the community. Next. So I wanna, I wanna, I want you to sit back and I really want you to reflect on this PowerPoint. What comes to mind when you hear about words or narratives or images, anything in general when it has to do with anything with sex work? street work, you know, the word prostitute, trafficking victim, and survivor. I want you to put it in the chat. I'm going to give you a little time while I talk a little bit more in depth about uh, the slide. But, you know, when I first started in the field, the P word, prostitute, was used very often. And, you know, and, and, and through the change of, of, of language, I started realizing why it's so important, uh, you know, not to use the P word. I call it the P word because basically a lot of these individuals who are partaking in sex work or transactional work, they find it very, 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 uh, how can I say, stigmatizing as it is. They have a lot of stigma. They have a lot of barriers. Um, survival, I heard that, great. Uh, necessity circumstances. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about the, the PowerPoint, how all this are, uh, why the reason why people do sex work and do transsexual work. When you hear trafficking victim, you know, um, there's a, a, a lot of, you know, things that, you know, the empathy, you know, and, and, and what they go through and then when they're a survivor. And I'm very happy that today there is a lot of uh, help for these individuals that are going through all, 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 all this, um, all this, uh, I can call it um, violence. Next. So I wanted you to kind of reflect on that because influences uh, your perspective. So a lot of it, we see it from media, from jokes. You know, I've heard, I've worked in this field for quite a while, more than a decade. And sometimes I hear even colleagues joking about, you know, people who do transactional work or sex work, you know, in social media and television, right? And, and, and we have to, we have to realize that that's stigma. 
you know, and we have to nip it. I always teach my team, you know, as a leader, as an advocate, uh, you know, that change of language, change the demeanor when they see somebody that's sex working or transactional working. Like I stated, colleagues, you know, uh, even among colleagues as well, you know, that are not in my organization, I will nip it. You know, it's so important to educate because educating, right, and all these trainings, and I'm very grateful that AACT has this, this topic because it's a very, very touchy topic. As you can see throughout my PowerPoint, I am not going to actually put a lot of pictures and uh, uh, women with high heels and, and stuff because all that stigma, you know, not everybody that wears high heels and short dresses are, are sex workers, right, or doing transactional work. So also from politicians and lawmakers, as you all know that, you know, there's a lot of laws that stop sex workers from sex working or doing transactional work. Um, in some states, it's illegal. Uh, and, you know, in some countries, it is legal, but not in not, um, most of the states in the United States, it's not. This is a very also important uh, being raised in church and religious institutions being a sex worker or even talking about sex working, it's really stigmatized. Uh, it's a no-no. Just the word sex itself, you know, uh, being raised that you don't talk about sex at a certain level, right, at a certain age, I mean, at a certain um, age and, and, and the setting, right? So sex workers come in with a lot of um, trauma and people who do transsexual work um, because of their religious background, you know, their family and friends and peers, you know, they are not very, um, how can I say, they don't open themselves to them. They're closeted in their work because they don't want, they, they don't want to be discriminated, you know, and I'm going to talk a little bit about through my PowerPoint because I've worked with this population throughout, throughout, um, throughout the, 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 my years in my profession. You know, I worked in, in El Paso. I worked in, in Juarez area with, uh, uh, people who do sex work. Uh, I have friends that do transactional work. Uh, and, and, and basically, you know, uh, it is the oldest profession in the world. Also lived in experience. It's very important to, um, you know, I always listen to people who have lived in experience in sex working and transactional work, even though I'm going to out it out. I did it when I was actively using, you know, uh, basically, uh, when I was using heroin, I was a person who injected drugs, right, years ago. Um, I always listen to the person that has living experience because it's so important. Next. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between from sex work and transactional work. You know, I've been, um, it is the oldest profession in the world. Never thought about that. Yeah, it is. You know, in the ancient times, you know, if you went to uh you know, wherever in the Roman times or, you know, brothels, you know, different, you know, it's, it's been forever where sex working has been happening. Um, but uh, sex work, when a person identifies as a sex worker, that means that they are sex working, right? I've worked through a lot of, with a lot of people that sex work and they, when I'm doing the, 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 conversation and I love the way you know a lot of the presenters said earlier being person-centered and having that individual and you can tie in from substance use to changing whatever you learn throughout the day's training to sex working it's the same meaning that client where they're at not stigmatizing and if that person self-identifies as a sex worker they are sex working so a person who does transactional work does not self-identify self, self as a sex worker. They will say, I'm not a sex worker. I do this kind of work to pay myself for different ways, like from college or, you know, and I, you'll show a little bit more of the difference in the, next, um, in the next slide. So sex workers do it for money or goods or exchange. So basically a sex worker can have somebody come in, let's say scenario, get their money, their, their, whatever they're going to get, you know, money or goods exchange, and then partake in the, in the sex, right? And then they move on. A transact, in transaction work, uh, transactional work, basically, it's more of like basically for money and goods as well, but there's also an intimate relationship. 
So in other words, uh, they can, I've known a lot of people who do transactional work and they've paid themselves ways to college. They've paid themselves the ways to, to empower themselves and also sex workers too. You'd be surprised. I've seen sex workers that do sex working and they, and they are very, you know, they can live stably. Um, but there's different types of settings of, of, of scenarios of, of how sex workers and transactional works do their work. But um, I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about it more in the, in, in the, in the future PowerPoints. But also for sex working, there's real little, little uh, chance of intimacy. I've seen uh, a lot of people that when they sex work, they just want their money and then they can move forward. Uh, there's not even no uh, intimate, no kissing most of the time, just the act of sex work. Um, so uh, that's the difference. For um, during the sex work, you know, the money is exchanged, like I said, but um, for transactional work, they can't even get the money or the, uh, the goods before they partake. So basically they can't meet somebody, they can't even have a boyfriend or, or, you know, somebody that they're going to, they have a good relationship, intimate relationship, but then they're going to get the money before, and then eventually they get the sex work and they are having that intimacy in a relationship through a prolonged time. Next. I really wanted to you to differentiate the sex between sex work and transactional work. And remember, uh, a lot of people, and I still hear it, you know, in, in organizations when I go, um, you know, because it is a criminalized topic, uh, you know, and they feel unsafe on uh, disclosing, like I said earlier, but because a lot of, I even still hear in organizations where they're still saying the word streetwalkers, you know, stuff like that, you know, it's very important that we have to understand that these are people in general, right? And that sex work is work, you know, and it doesn't have to be male or females. It's a gender spectrum. It's, it can be all spectrum, including trans and non-binary uh, folks. In my work field, I, I always have a person, especially if they come into my office for any services, right? Uh, they can come in for, for uh, any type of harm reduction, right? Uh, HIV testing and counseling, or, you know, they just want to talk, you know, they want to have a conversation. So that's what, and I, I love the way uh, somebody, one of the speakers stated how using a motivational interviewing and seeing that person, I've had individuals come into my office who are, you know, uh, they don't ad identify as LGBT, but they still are sex working, right? Males and having that conversation and that trust, right? So that individual can say, you know what, Miss Claudia, I am sex working. You know, I am sex working for these reasons, you know? And then I can say, okay, well, I say, thank you for, for trusting me. And, and let's open, that's an open door for me. So I can say, okay, what's going on? Let's have a conversation, right? Different racial and ethnic groups through practice of cultural humility. Uh, humility. You know, a lot of people do it because of their background, their, 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 their way they're upbringing through, you know, their practices. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people, uh, when I worked at a lot of work in Mexico, uh, especially in Juarez area, where it, I saw uh, people that were sex, work, uh, sex working or transactional working at the age of 12, 13, right? Because they were raised that, they saw that from, from their parents and that was for survival. So, you know, I really, it, it caught my attention, right? It caught my attention. So I really would get there and help encourage those clients to see how I could help them, right? Sex workers and, and transactional workers can be parents or pregnant people and caregivers. You'd be surprised. Um, you know, um, I know that when I was out uh, in the beat more than I am now, right? Because I'm in leadership now. But when I was out in the beat, you know, basically um, I would see pregnant females that were sex working, right? And then there were certain people that would go out and seek the pregnant people, uh, pregnant people, pregnant females, because that was their fetish, you know? And then I would really get into that conversation with them. 
you know, and I'm going to talk a little bit about substance use in the, in the future, uh, in, in, in the other slides. So people in precar precarious economic housing and life circumstances, I saw in the chat how somebody said, yes, it's because of the economy, they're struggling, um, the way they're, they're in poverty. You know, I've seen family members where, you know, uh, either the male or the female, right? They identify as male, female, they have children and they're both sex working, right? Just to uh, survive. Next. So these are drivers of sex uh, work engage engagement, right? Or, you know, it can also be for transactional work. So social pressure, you know, uh, a lot of people now, you know, and, and, and I was telling this to my team here at Dismas, you know, before, you know, you couldn't see, you were limited to see what you could see in TV. I'm not saying that we're out there, you know, social media is out there. We're in 2023. A lot of things, you know, I know that uh, children now are more open to see, you know, a pressure, whatever's going with society. And a lot of them, it's a learned behavior and they go into sex working, right? Or transactional work. Um, they see that 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 uh, that's a way for them to to survive, for them to to be able to uh, pay for their addiction, and that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about the addiction. You know, uh, most people that have addictive personality, uh, when I have conversations with them, uh, and it's uh, it's evidence based that. Uh, are there any uh, prevention, sex work, and transactional work? So I did look into it. There is a little bit of data, but it's not. Um, so I think that it's so important to have that 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 that, that data and that 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 that, that um, conversation. And 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 whenever there's sex working, we could do it. You know, I know that when you test in counsel for HIV, the question is. Are you have are you partaking in sex work or any type of uh, multiple partners? But uh, the data is not accurate because not everybody's disclosing. Um, I've learned in time that when you test in counsel, you know, and you ask about multiple partners and if they're sex working, some of them will not be honest. You know, they will not be what they will not because they feel uncomfortable because of all the stigma. Um, and, and the addiction, you know, a lot of people who have, who are, have an addiction not only to, to drugs, people who use drugs, but also people who, who gamble, people who have a shopping uh, addiction, basically can, will uh, engage in sex working and transactional work to, to uh, get their, their, their addiction uh, resolved, right, to get their fulfillment. Um, a lot, supplemental income, a lot of people, you know, um, what is it? The level of risk are so high, even this. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and you know what? Um, it's very, and I'm going to say, it, you know, I was in El Paso, Texas, because I was presenting for, um, um, for a, a conference over there. And I was presenting on harm reduction uh, with the Valley AIDS. And I went to Quad as quickly. And I was able to talk to the transgender individuals over there who do a lot of sex work and also females uh, who do sex work. And most of them are, you know, they die during the sex work because of the violence or also there are, you know, targeted by, by, um, by uh, the cartel to pay the quota upon whatever their sex working, their money or transaction will work. Uh, what I've seen in San Antonio, because recently I did move from San Antonio to a, uh, a Corpus Christi. I was working at Corazon Ministries uh, at San Antonio, uh, and I had the case load up because I was 1016 and counseling for HIV under the EHE grant, and, and I got to have all my, uh, mostly all my case load were sex working, you know, the majority uh, having, uh, you know, some of them were living with HIV, um, some of them were, you know, had, were living with hepatitis C. So that's where I really got to see what's happening in San Antonio and in the state of Texas. In El Paso, I was doing more, uh, doing more treatment, working in treatment for substance use. Uh, but, you know, in San Antonio, I really got to see how these individuals who are sex working 
and, and, and have an addictive personality, you know, in general, how, you know, the codependency and how they have so many challenges. You know, I'm trying to start and learn more how to change language as I go in my profession. I don't call it issues no more. Um, you know, I call it challenges because I think that once you overcome that challenge, because when I sit an issue, I can, for me, uh, and, and get me wrong, when I talk to a client, I say, it's an issue. Then they'll be like, you know, but when I say it, it's a challenge, let's work with that challenge. And yes, I saw a lot of people who who use heroin in San Antonio, right? And who are sex working and also who, who are uh, uh, addicted to methamphetamines. But, you know, I work with that, with that. Uh, how can I help you? How can I help you to overcome that challenge? Remember, I'm your cheerleader. I'm here to help you. A lot of them, you know, they have a place. They're not houseless, you know? They just need some supplemental income, right? So I talk to them and say, okay, let's do the referral system. Let's have a conversation, you know, and it can be done in one session. You know, sometimes, you know, it has to take three to four or five se uh, sessions for that confidence and that trust. Because remember, we are work, uh, working with this population. They are very stigmatized. They come in with a lot of masks, right? And hopefully as a counselor, as a clinician, or if you're trying to encourage this population, you have to help them to take this mask off, right? So they can come out and be themselves and say, you know what? I am sex working. I'm doing this. You know, okay, let's work on a plan. Uh, if they're not ready to work on a plan, hey, meet them where they're at, right? They can come in for harm reduction, right? And they can reduce, you know, uh, the 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 risk of them harming themselves you know um casual i know a lot of people that do casual sex right uh sex working right hey uh i heard some of one of my friends you know and she does casual uh sex work once in a while and and she says well i'd rather get the the 100 dollar bill than somebody else right and i was like okay do you do this often I just do it casually, you know, if a guy comes up to me and offers me, offers me money, great, okay, so you do it casually, and then I saw in the chat survival, yeah, it's for survival, I think that sex working and transactional work has been, it is the oldest profession, it's always been for survival, I know, I'm going to say it, uh, uh, you know, when I did sex work, it was survival for me to, uh, you know, pay for my addiction, which was uh, uh, heroin, you know, and, and 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 it took me to a lot of, how can I say, and, and I'm going to really share my, my experience. It took me to a lot of places where, you know, today, you know, I scratch my head and I say, wow, you know, you know, it takes a lot, you know, and, 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 the, and people that come into my office who are sex working or doing transactional work, they come in and say, you know what, it really takes a lot of energy and myself, it's a lot of work. You know how when we get out of work and we're tired, we're seeing clients, right? Computer reports or, you know, meeting clients, they also get tired because, it, you know, they're, they're seeing clients every day. You know, they're, 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 they're meeting their boyfriend or they're, 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 you know, it can be a, a person who pays for their, their needs, right? I don't know. I, I really don't like the word sugar daddy, but you know, it, it, it is right. It is what it is, but you know, I, you know, I, I have to listen to these individuals, right? And also put my empathy. Some of you might not have living experience and that's okay. It doesn't take to have living experience to help an individual. You know, I, uh, for me, and, and you know, I'm gonna share this, for me to change, it took a person, a clinician to sit me down, you know, and put the picture right in front of me after like, going in and out, right, into the office, right, for many sessions, it took me time. How, you know, I could see myself in the future, right? And then the bulb lit up, you know, I always say that, boom, right? So, and that person didn't have uh, addictive personality, never sex work, right? But he knew when there was a male, he knew 
SNL CDC how to get to me and hear me out and make me feel empowered, make me feel, uh, you know, not go in there and say, okay, here are some condoms, here's this, you know. Uh, no, have that conversation before giving out those condoms. Next. Thank you. So difference between human trafficking and sex working. Um, you know, it is happening in San Antonio. A lot of human trafficking is being done not only in San Antonio, but throughout the state and throughout the nation. Um, but uh, I know that in San Antonio, it's very common uh, because of all the, the highways, you know, going from Laredo up, you know, all the way from Corpus up to San Antonio, going to Austin, going to Houston, going to Dallas, you know, uh, and sex trafficking is happening. You know, I always, when I go out uh, into, uh, and I teach my team, right, uh, whenever they hear about anything that's happening against willingness, whenever they hear it about a client or anybody in the outreach setting that they hear that it's fraud or trickery to talk to that individual and encourage that individual to basically get help, right? You know, or report it, right? Uh, we have to report human trafficking, it's mandated. It's happening out there. Sometimes there, I, I had a, a, a situation uh, in El Paso, Texas, where I was doing the outreach setting in the grips. That's why I put it earlier. You know, somebody says, are, are we doing outreach? Yeah, we're doing outreach, but what type of outreach? You know, a lot of folks aren't coming into the drop-in centers. They're not coming into our HIV clinics. They're not coming into uh, where we think, you know, where it's, it is a safe space, right? They don't feel comfortable. So how many outreach workers are going into the outreach? I call it in-depth outreach, right? Encampments into the hotels. You know, you don't see people who are sex, uh, sex working or, or sex trafficking, right? Out in the open no more. You know, a lot of them are doing inside, closed, right? So if you see any fraud or trickery, report it. I'm all for it. The difference is for sex work, it's a choice. And I always say that. If you say I'm going to sex work, it's my choice. It's not forced. It's not core. core. It's not, you know, uh, how to say if you're somebody has you like if you don't do this, I'm gonna hurt you, right? Uh, it's consensual for sex work. That's the difference. Uh, whenever there's sex trafficking for minors, remember we do have to report it. And 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 I don't know if there's a lot of people here who do a lot of outreach. Um, it's very important that you report any type of minor uh, sex trafficking or any anything that has to do that's not consensual, right? Or anything that, that, that's against the law. Also for sex working, if you're an adult and it's, it's by choice, hey, right? Uh, for no income, sex trafficking, they don't get no income. It's not a choice, they're forced. Uh, and then for sex working, it's income-based and then there's an exchange. Uh, a lot of, uh, I've seen a lot of, people, you know, that come into my office, you know, and they, and oh, throughout the, the, the years that I worked with uh, this population and my caseloads, they don't see it that sex working uh, is for an exchange. A lot of them say, well, I'm not sex working, Miss Claudia. You know, I just do it for somewhere to stay, you know, um, for food, for a hamburger. You know, you'd be surprised what uh, people who are in need will do for sex working or transactional work, okay? So you have to listen to these people. Uh, and, 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 and I'll say it, you know, a lot of people when they hear about sex working or, 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 you know, they get like, you know, uncomfortable. So remember, we have to understand that they are here to get services. If they come up to you and disclose it for a reason that they are wanting and, and seeking help. Next. So advocacy for sex workers, it's so important. You know, it's very, uh, you know, it's not legal, right? In most of the states, right? But abolitionists think that all sex trade is trafficking. You know, they see, they don't see, they just either see black, right? 
or white. You know, there's no in between. Okay. Uh, to empower, we can say sex work is work. Trafficking is slavery. So we have to work that, you know, we have to empower this population, like I stated earlier. So for abolitionists, other options for income, and I always hear that, and I'm going to say it, I always hear it from clinicians who say, uh, say, oh, thank you, thank you, Ricky. Um, so, you know, other say, well, they can get a better job, or they can Hey, that's not client-centered. If you're saying that you're client-centered, right, or person-centered and meet clients where they're at, right, then that's not, you're not working the client-centered plan. You know, if they decide to sex work till they die, we're there to help them and encourage them to not harm themselves. That's why harm reduction is so important. How are other ways of strategy to help these individuals, you know, and reduce for them not to get an HIV uh, uh, transmission and also other communicable diseases. Empowerment, best option for income, right? There's other, you give them options. You know, whenever I have a client come in and I've said it this in San Antonio, uh, I always give them a buffet, right? I always tell them, okay, I'm gonna empower you. I'm your cheerleader, I'm here. You know, sometimes I don't throw it out to all sex workers that I sex for. It all depends on the client where I'm at, that I'm working. Right, and then the referral system is so important. And where are we referring these clients? Is it a safe space? Are they gonna accept this person that sex working or transactional working in a safe space, right? Because not all safe spaces say they're safe spaces and they're not, right? I've had clients come in and say, no, Miss Gabriel, you mean they treated me worse, you know, they did this, they did that, and I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's go find out what's going on. You know, and I don't go, I encourage, you know, and I talk to whoever's in need and I advocate for the client. I sit down and have a conversation. Remember, as, as educators and colleagues, we all here to teach each other and help each other in a proper way, right? Not in a demeanor way, right? Or, you know, I learned that through the work, you know, we have to have that conversation and hopefully, you know, we can help other organizations to work with these populations but because not every pop, not every organization is willing to work with sex workers or people who do transactional work. Policy, policy, policy abolition, policing reduces sex work. Police say, well, let's get the police. Why not? We're going to get them out of the street. We got to get them out of the, you know, uh, out of the social media, right? That's not helping. It helps them to go underground then that helps stop them from getting services. It, it, it stops them from testing and counseling, getting condoms, harm reduction, right? Um, they are more susceptible to violence and other uh, things. Abolition and sex worker leads to violence and crime. You know, um, hey, sex work should be protected from violence and crime. Instead of saying, yeah, there's violence and crime, when are we gonna protect this population? Right? They can, if they get, uh, I've had situations where they come in my office and they say, well, Ms. Claudia, you know, they took my money, they beat me, they took the money after the act, right? How are they gonna call police if it's not, you know, it, you know, it's not, they overlook it, right? I've had situations where it's stated that police go over there, you know, and they say, well, you know, they're not going to voice out, right, that they did the sex work act, but they, they took their money. And a lot of these people who are working with this population that are uh, law enforcement, they know they're sex working and they overlook it. It is happening. Next. So are sex workers rights human rights? What do you think? I want, I want you to put, I, I want to hear a little bit from the, you know, from the, from the chat, are sex workers human rights? Okay, so what's the difference from my rights, right? What's the, absolutely, right, yes. So what's the difference from mine, you know, I'm here as, as you know, as a job, eight to five, right, or a little over, right? And I have human rights, I'm working, right? Why can't sex workers have those rights? 
they have control what they do with their body, right? I, I don't know. That's why I, it's a very, very touchy subject. Uh, you know, I respect everybody's opinions. But remember, if we're going to help this population, we have to put our bias out the window. Throw it out the window. Because if I come in with my bias, how am I going to empower this individual and help them move right in any way in the HIV cascade or, or in general to help them get into treatment or detox or to help them empower them to use condoms or help them to, you know, work on positioning. Well, I went, well, there's sex working, right? Different positions, right? To reduce HIV transmission or other communicable diseases, right? We have to be there for them and, 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 and not put our own bias. I teach my team all the time. Bias, throw it out the window. And I love the, the presenter that, did, that, that talked a little yes, uh, earlier on, on, on the presentation, how, you know, we have to be very person-centered, right? To not be beaten, harassed for being a sex worker. You know, I work with a houseless population. A lot of them that are sex working are beaten among their population, right? Because they see them as different, right? Because they're sex workers. They're a target, right? So it's very important to encourage them to empower themselves it's hard for them when they're out there, especially when they're houseless, they have substance use and mental health. The three comorbidities, right? And it's so important to address it, you know, and help and encourage them to address, uh, if they want to address their mental health, if they want to address their substance use. You know, I'm going to share a little bit about this. You know, I, 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 I got into the recovery process in 20, 2007 from uh, using heroin, right? And I remember still having two years into my recovery process, right? I wasn't using drugs, but hey, it was, you know, I was barely trying to get a job, right? I wasn't I was in volunteering this in this work. That was 14 years ago, right? And and you know, if somebody, a guy came and said, God, you wanna sure, right? Give me some money and we'll do the app, right? I'm not using drugs. Hey, until you know, I had to realize, you know. I am still sex working, right? Which wasn't wrong, right? But there's a lot of people, you don't have to be using drugs. You can be in recovery and still be doing sex working, right? And maybe when that client comes in, yeah, they're in that recovery process or they're, uh, uh, you know, basically taking their HIV medication and in recovery, right? Uh, but also, in, you know, help them, you know, are you still sex working? Well, yeah, you know, I'm sex working for, you know, I need, I need this and that, right? So also human rights declaration, this article protects all of us. It's about, you know, everyone has a right to work, free choice of employment, favorable conditions of work, right? Everyone without any discrimination has the equal right, pay for equal work. When is it going to be when sex workers are able to have this right? I want you guys to think, do you think it would help this population in many ways? How can it help this population, right? No one should be subjected to torture or cruel, right? It says right there, or inhumane, de 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 degrading punishment or treatment, right? You know, um, a lot of people feel that, you know, they shouldn't legalize it. A lot of people are for legalizing it, right? We got to see the picture, right? Next. Benefits of legalizing sex work. This is what I really like. It would reduce crime. Why? It was just like I said earlier, a, a person who's sex working or a person that's doing transactional work, if there's any type of crime, they can report it, right? They can improve their public health, right? They can help them to basically go and disclose openly, you know, and get maybe insurance if they're, they see it as a, as, you know, as, a, as work, as legal work. Increase tax revenue. Maybe we can have them also pay taxes. Help people out of, of, of poverty, right? It is, it's gonna help them out of poverty, get sex workers off the streets, right? Uh, basically, they can work, uh, find other ways, right? 
Uh, it can be through social media. A lot of, I had a, a person, a dear friend of mine I'm in El Paso. She was a trans uh, individual who identifies as a trans woman uh, living with HIV, um, dated a soldier, met him on, 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 on I think it was on, um, I think it was Craigslist. It was back then, it was Craigslist. And he was military, young man, 23, was seeing him off and on, on the, uh, and sex working. And eventually something happened, but he ended up stabbing her to death, right? So it came out to what happened, what happened with this? Well, she was a person that was living with HIV, right? Um, he didn't kill her, don't go right there because she had HIV. He had killed her because of her uh, a drug. He was also smoking meth over a, a drug dispute. You see, when I said person living with HIV, a lot of people think right away the stigma. Well, he killed her because she didn't disclose. No, it was because of, of a, a substance uh, dispute. They both had substance. He did get a life sentence. Uh, so, you know, and it is uh, Transgender Day of Awareness this week. Transgender Day of Remembrance. That's what it is. Help people uh, enable sex workers and clients to report crimes without fear. How can we help our population, especially if you have a person who's sex working or doing transactional work and you have them in front of, you know, in your office or they're seeing for medical service, they're getting HIV tested. How can we encourage them to report crimes without fear? Right? We have to have that conversation with them. We have to explain to them that they are human beings. Right, they don't have to disclose that they're sex working because a lot of law enforcement would they can report the crime. Allow sex workers to get insurance and, like I said it earlier, financial services. It's so important. You know, I have friends that are sex working since 20, 30 years, and you know, um, it'd be great. And I have that conversation with them. They're my friends, they're not my clients, they're my friends. And I talk to them and tell them, okay. So uh, the conversation of insurance and financial and retirement, right? And, and, and if it be legal, they can get retirement services. Have you ever thought of that? You know, uh, I have a friend that's almost my age and, she, you know, she's still sex working. But that's where the, are you saving money? You can have a conversation. Are you saving money for whatever, you know, not everybody that's sex working or doing transactional work are, is for drugs, right? Like I said earlier, are they saving money? Are they, what's their future looking for? I always have conversations with them like that. What do you see the long run, the picture? Next. HIV and sex work, the prevention challenges. So the lack of data, it's, it, it, it's happened, you know, not because everybody's not disclosing that they're doing sex work or doing transactional work. Um, you know, I've been working in prevention for years, uh, you know, in all areas, treatment, you know, uh, testing and counseling, harm reduction. Um, I am a prevention advocate. So, you know, how can we get in, and you know, this whole symposium is about uh, ending the HIV epidemic, right? So how are we gonna help this population to really help them disclose so we can put in them data, right? And we can encourage, right? More money, more policy and advocate for this population. They should be treated with equal rights. Right, but not everybody thinks like that. So us as clinicians and as professionals, we have to voice out that out and advocate. Advocate for that, right? Social economic factors. Those are challenges as well. So what is CDC doing? I don't want you to change this slide. Who can put me in the in the chat? What is CDC doing? to help this population for prevention for HIV and sex work, like 
uh, reduce their risk of acquiring HIV or they are living with HIV, right? Oh, I'm hard, sorry to hear that. Yeah, you know, uh, people just uh, overlook. They just see them not only because of the trans identity, but also as a sex worker, right? They're just, uh, just not thinking, you know, human being, we're human, you know, they are human beings. So yeah, like what is CDC doing? Lack of personalization of care plans. Right. We have treatment plans. We have we have plans for uh, HIV, but what about uh, plans for people who sex work? Do we have a plan? Do we have like a, you know, So what is CDC doing? CDC doing is doing basically funding, right? Um, next, um, helping uh, funding for EHE and in the HIV epidemic uh, programs. Um, you know, national HIV AIDS strategy 2023-25. Um, this is their, you know, their 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 vision and their mission. You know, I think that you know, and, and I really was. I loved it whenever the doctor shared about, you know, uh, breastfeeding, you know, or, you know, you know, how uh, HIV transmission can be passed on through, through uh, breastfeeding, you know, because like, honestly, a lot of things like we're so outdated, you know, that we're not up to what's going on. You know, I still, I, 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 I give training, I'm going to give a training on, on Saturday, to uh, professionals, right? A licensed counselor that work for probation and stuff. And they're so outdated, you know, they're still going on the five, 10 years back, right? So we have to be updated. That's why these trainings are so important. And thank you to UT Health uh, and ATC. UT Health is the one that also funds here my program here in, in, in Corpus. Um, so it's so important that, that, that we have to know how are we gonna get to to ending the HIV epidemic. Keep up with CDC and all the statistics and how we can help these folks uh, who are at risk, especially people who are sex working, right? And who are who are doing transactional work. You know, we have to uh, really engage with these clients. You know, sometimes we focus ourselves on uh, males who are having sex with males or transgender folks but what about the whole picture, right? What about the whole picture of uh, 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 the whole picture of people who are sex working? You know, I went, I was uh, in San Antonio because I like to talk. I like to ask, you know, and I like to talk to people, you know, and, and a lot of them are sex working uh, and identify as male, right? And they're sex working um, with with people, right? And 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 and. They, and I asked them, have you ever tested? No. Have you ever, why? Well, because people don't ask me. They assume that I'm not. I said, well, you should, do you want to? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, well, we wouldn't. I said, well, you need to speak out, right? And, and, and a lot of them is because of, you know, um, a lot of them is because of their circumstances, you know, um, their disability. A lot of people that are sex working have are disabled as well. But I'm very grateful that CDC sees the strategy. I know that um, uh, there's so many uh, or, uh, people who are helping out uh, NIH, uh, NIDA, SAMHSA, National HIV AIDS, ATC, UT Health, all this. Well, we don't use the word prostitution, but isn't sex working, well, I, I'm not in my platform, isn't sex working uh, legal in some countries? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. In some countries, it is legal. Is uh, Nuevo Laredo and Juarez very regulated? Um, to be honest, I don't know about Nuevo Laredo, but I can tell you Juarez like the back of my hand. It used to be very regulated when the cartel was there from 2007 to 2014. 
people who were sex working really had to pay quota to the to the cartel. So let's say scenario because their their pay over there is like twenty dollars for an act of sex work. So out of those twenty dollars, they would have to get give cartel five dollars. And if they didn't give their share, uh, basically they would get beaten, they would get uh, assaulted, and even killed. I know a lot of trans folks have gotten killed because of that. So, uh, and a lot of people who are sex working, especially um, down, like Don Juan is the, the main strip when you go down cost Juarez. But yeah, yeah, you know, these populations now are, police leave them a little bit, but they're more subjected to the cartel. They're more subjected to, um, to uh, how can I say, the Johns, right? People who are sex working with them, doing the violence. But uh, it's very in-depth over there. Um, a lot of sex workers that are united, they unite and they help each other. They congregate because they know that they are a population that are targeted. So I know for a fact when I worked in the beat in El Paso and Juarez and San Antonio, they're, they're in a certain area. Uh, they always communicate within each other um, because, yes, I know I can talk, right? They communicate with each other because they know that they can help each other. You know, and I, 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 I teach my team whenever they go to these places, wherever these people are sex working or doing transactional work to respect. If they don't want the harm reduction, it's okay. But also, um, you know, explain to them how the national HIV strategy is willing to help them, you know, so we can help their population. Um, also, how I have to ask if they have a, a pen because they still have, their boyfriend can be their pen. I have to have that respect and ask the pen if I can talk to the, uh, the, the, the the girlfriend who's sex working or the boyfriend, they can't, it doesn't have to. And yes, I have to respect all that. And I teach my team because it's another different story, but it's harm reduction and guidelines. But yeah, next. So harm reduction, harm reduction works in social justice. I think that harm reduction drop in center. There's one in El Paso, Punto de Partida, one in Austin, Texas Harm Reduction Alliance, one in San Antonio, uh, Corazon Ministries. Here in Corpus, I'm gonna open my doors next week. This must recovery resource centers. This is like when somebody stated earlier, one of the doctors, where I have a washer, a dryer, a shower. I can give them a snack, right? I can bring them in and then have that conversation, right? Um, can you repeat that group from El Paso? Punto de Partida, Recovery Alliance. Punto de Partida. So that's the harm reduction and drop-in center. So basically where they can come in and they can have a safe space, they can get a coffee, uh, they can have a little snack. Right now, especially in this cold weather, this is where we're going to have the conversation and they say, okay, let's get to work. Next. So, Organizational awareness, questions to reflect. What are their sex needs? Do staff at Stego feel comfortable sharing tasks, right? Does the health department collect or track any data? This is so important. We saw how the data is used. I always ask, when I'm gonna give my data, I know I, I wanna know where it's going. I'm sorry, I'm gonna be like, okay, what is it for? Is it gonna help my community that I'm working for? Which partners or organizations do you talk if you have questions about sex workers' health and experiences in your jur jurisdictions? It's so important. I'm very picky where I refer my clients. I'm sorry. I love, I'm gonna, I, we started a collaboration among organizations in San Antonio. I'm gonna do it here in Corpus. I'm opening my doors next, next week and I'm gonna start collaborating with all these agencies that work with this population, people who are HIV, I have a big space here. They can meet here and let's let's get to working. How we can work as orgs and empower our community. Next. Their stories are so important. Next, we have to listen to their stories. We have to 
always, uh, you know, remember that we have to engage them, build empower, empower them so they can empower others. It doesn't matter if they're still sex working or doing transactional work. You can empower them and they can empower others. They feel better about themselves. Think about rights, not rescue. Nothing about us without us. Just the movement. I'm an advocate, right? Next. What sex workers want? Look at all what they want. Freedom, stop stigma. I'm tired of being homeless. This is what I hear. This is what I hear. We want our rights. Don't punish us. You know, they come in like this, like, no, Mrs. K, you know? Have them empower them. Come in with freedom. Say, you know what? I'm a sex worker. I'm doing this. I'm doing transactional work. You know, let's have a conversation. Next. Dismantle barriers, interpersonal stigma, right? Reflecting on interaction with sex workers. It's so important. Remember, partners in community, like I said, let's get together. Let's not fight for numbers, right? If we start fighting for numbers or matrix, we're not going to get nowhere. Institutional barrier, changing our organization to better serve sex workers. I work with a, an, agent, an organization that's federal funded. So right now I'm opening, I'm the first director to work with a criminal background, with sex working background as a director. And I'm gonna push the envelope in my organization, right? They're like, but it's okay. Somebody's gotta do it, right? Next. Things to remember, sex workers are good people. They, they have their own struggles just like we do. They deserve basic human rights. That means access to healthcare, freedom, discrimination, stigma, and be HIV free or living positively with HIV. 